The prequel trilogy introduced a ton of new ship designs to the Star Wars universe, and one of the most recognizable of these is the Naboo N1 Starfighter. This sleek, elegant little ship stands in stark contrast to the rougher, used-looking fighters of the original trilogy, and in the years since the release of The Phantom Menace, it's become just as iconic. But apart from looking cool, the N1 was an engineering masterpiece, as was the case with a number of other Naboo Starfighter designs. In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at these craft and determining what made them so effective. Attention, Sergeant on deck! The Naboo used a number of Starfighters over the years, but since most were based on the N1, we're going to be focusing on the N1 for now. This agile starfighter was a perfect example of the many unique features Naboo shipbuilders worked into their craft, which were simultaneously works of art and brilliant pieces of engineering. The most readily apparent feature was the chrome finish present on the starfighter's forward sections. This design motif dated back to the earliest days of Naboo spaceflight, in which Naboo craft meant for upper atmospheric flight were coated in chrome as protection from harmful radiation from Naboo's sun. Modern electromagnetic fields meant this was no longer necessary, but chrome was retained as a design motif on Naboo craft meant for the use or protection of the reigning monarch. Ships meant for the monarch's personal use were completely coated in chrome, while the ships of the Naboo Royal Space Fighter Corps only had partial chrome finishes. The chrome finish on all Royal Starships was applied and polished by hand, showcasing the dedication the Naboo had to this tradition. Other Naboo aesthetic motifs included the rounded and aerodynamic shapes of the N1 and other Naboo craft, and the use of spine-like finials at the ends of the engines and cockpit section. While these things would seem mostly decorative, Naboo ships had some functional quirks as well. Beneath their homemade space frames, the N1 and most other Naboo ships were built from off-world components, but these were typically modified to tweak performance. Most notably, the N1 Starfighter used Nubian engines and hyperdrive units, but these were modified to reduce emissions for in-atmospheric flight. These modifications meant that the engines burned hotter, which had the side effect of allowing the Starfighter to fly faster. This required the addition of heat sinks to the engine design, but these were ingeniously worked into the seemingly decorative finials at the ends of the engines. Indeed, many of the N1's apparently decorative features served a practical purpose as well. Even the expensive chrome finish served to dazzle enemy pilots in combat, forcing them to adjust the optical settings on their targeting equipment. These design quirks weren't limited to the N1. All Naboo starfighters followed many of the same trends. Granted, this was partly because most of them were variants of the N1, but that's neither here nor there. Now let's take a look at the N1 in detail. The Naboo N1 Starfighter was jointly designed by the Theed Palace Space Vessel Engineering Corps and Nubia Star Drives Incorporated, with the vessels being built in Theed from Nubian components. The Starfighter was 11 meters long and was roughly a T-shape when viewed from above with a long, central body with engines mounted at the ends of a set of forward wings. Each fighter required a single pilot and a single R2 series astromech droid, and they could carry 65 kilograms of cargo and a week's worth of consumables. Though the N1 featured a set of proper landing gear, it was rarely used. When stored in the Theed hangar, the craft would be suspended via repulsor lift while the central finial on the rear of the craft plugged into specialized sockets in the walls of the hangar. The Royal J-type diplomatic barge had similar sockets built into its wings. These sockets doubled as charging ports for the Starfighter's power cells, and they also allowed the fighter's computer to download tactical data straight from the palace battle computer, which helped with operation security. Power from the Royal Palace's main generators was routed through the rear finial to four power cells on either side of the cockpit, which supplied power to the rest of the ship. The N1 Starfighter was propelled by a pair of J-type Nubian 221 engines, as we described earlier, 
which drew fuel from a pair of tanks in the craft's undercarriage. The N1 also had a hyperdrive located just aft of the fuel tanks, a Nubia Monarch C4. The engines could propel the Starfighter forwards at high speeds. In atmosphere, the N1 could top 1100 km per hour, and in space, it had a maximum acceleration of 3750 Gs. Its hyperdrive was also state-of-the-art, a Class 1.0, though it required an onboard astromech for navigational calculations and only had a range of a thousand light-years. The rest of the N1 was packed full of all sorts of little features. Apart from the battle computer interface and power nodes, the rear spine of the N1 Starfighter also contained inertial compensators, an electromagnetic signal receiver, and a computer interface for the craft's astromech. The nacelles on the tips of the engines contained rangefinders and targeting and flight sensors, while the wings hid a variety of other sensor systems. The nose of the craft contained communications equipment, and the N1 also had full life support systems and deflector shields. The fighter also came with a very advanced autopilot, which allowed pilots to focus on shooting things instead of navigation. Said pilot was seated in a cockpit in the middle of the central section, which the ship's astromech socket was located directly behind. This socket was actually too tight for an R2 series astromech to fit into properly. The droid had to reconfigure itself to fit. Of course, as with any good starfighter, the N1 also had guns. It boasted a pair of moderately powerful laser cannons built into its nose and a proton torpedo launcher built into its underside, stocked with up to 10 torpedoes. All told, the N1 was a versatile and highly effective starfighter, and it could fill a variety of mission roles. It was well suited for patrol and reconnaissance, as well as full-scale combat, and it was also used as an escort and for ceremonial purposes. The N1 did have drawbacks, however. It wasn't all that well armored, and it performed poorly in tight spaces. It also typically sucked at providing air support for ground forces, though it theoretically had the firepower to take out tanks and other armored ground vehicles. In space, however, the N1 was a force to be reckoned with. The Nabu N1 Starfighter came about during the reign of the infamously corrupt King Varuna, Queen Amidala's predecessor. The N1 was Varuna's pet project, and it was a symbol of how he was leading Nabu away from Thede's time-honored traditions of pacifism. The N1 entered service a few years before Varuna's death, and they remained in service through the reign of Queen Amidala. In fact, they were pretty much the only part of Varuna's legacy Amidala kept around. This turned out to have been a wise decision, as the N1s proved instrumental in the Nabu victory over the Trade Federation in the Battle of Nabu. The standard N1 Starfighter was only a part of the N1 series, however. It was preceded by the N1L, a smaller, lighter starfighter that packed much less of a punch, and the Nabu also designed the N1T, a tougher but rarely seen advanced variant. At some point, the NB-1 Royal Bomber was also developed, based on the design of the N1, but with large drop bays for deploying proton bombs. The NB-1 itself had two variants, the more powerful NB-1S and NB-1T the former of which was designed to deploy ion bombs, and the latter of which had a separate cockpit for a bombardier. There was also the NX Police Cruiser, a tremendous eyesore of a ship that was often used as a training vessel for new pilots. None of these variants were used much, and to be honest, that's probably for the best. As a commenter on one of our previous videos said, the designers of these ships had hidden talent that should have stayed hidden. Abominations aside, the N1 itself kicked ass, and despite its humble origins, it was one of the best starfighters of the era. Even during the Clone Wars, it could perform well against the more advanced craft of its time, and in its heyday, it was one of the fastest fighters in the galaxy. Nabu engineering truly was something else, if you ignore those variants we mentioned earlier. So, that's our look at the Nabu N1 starfighter and its cousins. But what do you think? Do you want to gouge your eyes out after seeing those variants? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comment section below.